Senators, that concludes co consideration of the bills in accordance with the resolution agreed to this morning. The Senate will now return to its routine of business. And we're on question time, so I'll call Senator Birmingham. Oh, you got it, Don. Yep. Uh, Minister Wong. President, um, I advise changes to Mr. Ministerial Order. Arrange. Senators, we are now in question time. We have Senator Wong on her feet. Please uh, sit down in your seats quickly. I'm going to call uh, Senator Wong again. Senator Wong. Thank you. I advise changes to ministerial arrangements as Senator Farrell will be absent from question time today on account of. You don't miss me this much, do you? I'm feeling sad. I'm injured. I, I feel injured. <laughs> oh, okay. In his absence, I will represent the Minister for Trade and Tourism. <laughs> Minister Senator Gallagher will. Order. will represent the Special Minister of State, the Minister for Social Services, the Minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme, the Minister for Government Services, the Minister for Housing and the Minister for Homelessness. And Senator Watt will represent the Minister for Resources and the Minister for Industry and Science. Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Birmingham. Thank you, President. President, my question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Wong. I refer the minister to her failure yesterday to address the specific question of whether the government of the Solomon Islands was given the courtesy of advanced knowledge of her intention to publicise the Australian government offer of financial assistance for the conduct of the Solomon Islands elections on schedule in 2023. I again specifically ask the minister, was the government of the Solomon Islands given the courtesy of advanced knowledge of the Minister's intention on Monday of this week to publicise the Australian offer of financial assistance for the conduct of the Solomon Islands elections on schedule in 2023. Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thank you, President, and thank you to Senator Birmingham for another question about Solomon Islands. I again refer to my previous answer and make the point that no announcement was made. Uh, as I said to him yesterday, I answered a question about Australian electoral assistance in the Solomons, which has been ongoing for 20 years. I am surprised that the government wishes to, knowing as they do, having been so recently in government, uh, and Senator Payne, I'm sure, could advise Senator Birmingham about this, knowing you know, the uh, challenge um, of a greater contest in our region, that the, gov that the opposition continues to want to press this. Uh, I was very clear. I was. I was. I was very. I was very clear. Well, I'll take the interjection about we were so reserved from the campaign. We remember the campaign. We remember the attempts from those on the other side to call people who, who in our side of politics, a Manchurian candidate. Disgrace. I was an absolute disgrace. Uh, so. Uh, yeah, I, I would hope there would be bipartisanship around uh, what is occurring in our region. The government has been, the government has been very clear uh, about the importance of both the Pacific and Southeast Asia. We have had the Prime Minister, myself, uh, Minister Conroy uh, and others in the region. Uh, we have increased the, the assistance through the Development Assistance Program. Uh, we have shifted on climate, which is the first national security priority of Pacific Island nations. Uh, and what I would say to the Shadow Minister for Foreign Affairs uh, that it might be best to leave behind some of the mistakes of, that were, were undertaken in government and perhaps work in a bipartisan way to strengthen Australia's security position in the Pacific. Uh, Senator Birmingham, first supplementary. President, has the minister or Prime Minister Albanese spoken with Solomon Islands Prime Minister Songavare since the Solomon Islands government released the extraordinary statement on Tuesday, accusing the minister and the Albanese government of interference in their domestic affairs? And if not, why not? Minister. We, we will engage as in the way we consider, as the Government of Australia, most appropriate for Australia's national interests with the government of the Solomon Islands. If, you, if the uh, for Shadow Foreign Minister had been looking at, I think, some social media. He would have seen that Solomon Islands is 
Uh, I think the Minister Masoudi, Foreign Minister Masoudi, uh, is visiting. Obviously, we will continue to engage with them as we do. And I have to say, I find it uh, passing strange that I get a question about engagement from a government uh, which had so little engagement, both before and after uh, a security agreement with China was entered into, and whose best response was to send Minister Zeselia. Um, thank you, Senator Birmingham. Uh, President, point of order. The question uh, was specifically. Oh, the minister's finished. Uh, I invite you to make your second supplementary. Thank you, President. I refer the minister to her statement in relation to Timor Leste's use of media to pressure the Australian government when, whilst in Timor Leste, she told a media conference on 1 September that discussions between countries, quote, are best done respectfully and directly, not through the media. Does the media concede that she failed to live up to her own standard by publicly revealing details of the offer to the Solomon Islands government? And I again invite the minister to be clear as to whether she or Prime Minister Albanese have spoken with Prime Minister Songavare since Tuesday. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Minister. Uh, we had a, a thank you, President, uh, and I'll take in response to the first part of the question, which deals with Timor Leste, is the minister might know if he. Uh, actually, uh, I hope he does take the time to familiarise himself. The context of my responses to media in Timor Leste, which, unlike um, you know, many uh, for many years, uh, we actually have visited. I think the last Australian foreign minister to visit was Ms. Bishop, uh, and I had uh, very good private discussions as well as public dis uh, as well as public engagement, uh, private discussions with the president and my, my counterpart, the Minister for Finance. The, the issue which concerns Timor Leste correctly uh, is uh, the economic and fiscal difficulties they, they see into the future as the Bayou Undan field uh, and the petroleum fund diminish, and the fact that the Greater Sunrise Project has been stalled for years. Unlike your government, we will work with them to try and resolve that issue. Uh, Senator Pratt. President, my question is to the minister representing the Minister for Climate Change and Energy, Senator Wong. Can the minister please update the Senate on the Albanese government's progress on ending the climate wars? And what does this mean for the Australian people? Uh, minister. Uh, thank you uh, to Senator Pratt for the question. And, uh, for, for many people in this change, or regrettably not those opposite, this day is a day that had been, has been a long time coming. Uh, a day in which uh, historic legislation has been passed in response to one of the most urgent and pressing issues of our time, climate change. It is no accident that the bill that the Senate has just voted on was one of the first pieces of legislation introduced by the Albanese government, because we know that Australians deserve and our nation needs overdue leadership in this area. I'll take that interjection from the National Party. It's all symbolic. It's all symbolic, is it? Well, it just really demonstrates how out of touch those are, those opposite are, how out of touch they are, and how little those in the coalition who actually might order. understand that order. the Australian people voted for climate change action uh, might want to be listened to. Might want to be listened to. So I want to first say, with the passage of legislation in this place, can I first acknowledge those who worked with the government constructively on sensible amendments, and can I also acknowledge the support from the business community, the Business Council of Australia, which said this legislation brings Australia a step closer to ending the so-called climate wars, which have been counterproductive and served as a handbrake on progress a handbrake on progress towards decarbonisation and have slowed Senator our Rennick. economy. And, of course, the National Farmers Federation, uh, who said in evidence to the Senate inquiry that the bills are, and I quote, framework legislation that can provide business certainty. Business certainty. I know it's hard for the National Party to realise that their base is not with them on this. It's, I know that's hard. Uh, but they are not. And of course, the investor group on climate change, which talked about the opportunity to unlock hundreds of billions of investment in climate solution, it is those opposite who are out of touch. Thank you, Minister. Senator Pratt, first supplementary. President, are oh, there, yeah. what are the international implications of the Albanese government's climate policy? Minister. 
Thank you. And I again thank Senator Pratt for her supplementary question and for her, along with every Labor Senator's interest in progress on climate. Uh, the rest of the world does watch closely what Australia does on climate, and as well as lifting our international competitiveness, the passage of this legislation is a watershed moment in Australia's international standing. You know, the countries of our region in particular look to Australia as a member of the Pacific family to act with respect for their existential interest in action on climate change. Uh, if the, if the, and if the shadow foreign minister actually wanted to ensure we had stronger relations with the Pacific, he would not have voted against action on climate change, which is precisely, precisely uh, one of the disadvantages to our national interests that the more former government continued continue to hold on to. It is simply not good enough for senators to say, well, this country isn't doing enough or that country isn't doing enough. The, our Pacific family expects more from us. Thank you, Minister. Senator Pratt, second supplementary. How does the Albanese government's climate policy listen to and deliver on the will of the Australian people at the last federal election? Minister. Thank you. Well, uh, President, we all know that this Senate for too long has stood in the way of climate action. Uh, and whether it's former Senator Barnaby Joyce uh, uh, or Senator Abetz in the past or today Senator Canavan, Senator Rennick and so many others, too many senators have been part of the problem, not part of the solution. Unfortunately, some senators still persist, and we, we see Senator Rennick now. Uh, and, and, you know, people who refuse to listen to the Australian people refuse to acknowledge the message at the federal election three months ago. So far, it's been more of the same for them. They opposed the climate bills they before, before they saw them. And what is most extraordinary is they just ignore the message of the Australian people. They just ignore the message of the Australian people. You're not, you're not content with losing touch with Australians in Boothby, Curtin, Goldstein, Thank you, Minister. Your time you're has just expired. out of touch. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Madam President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Early Childhood Education, Senator Watt. Minister, under Labor's proposed childcare changes, what will the increase in childcare subsidy be for a family earning $60,000? Is it true that the subsidy will lift from 90 per cent to 95 per cent under Labor's proposal? Minister. Thank you. Thank you, President. Uh, well, and yes, I am the representing minister. That is a statement of fact. And as the representing minister, what I can tell you is that the Order. Albanese Labor government will be delivering cheaper childcare for Australian families something that your government did not do. 97 per cent of families in Australia um, will be better Senator off Watt, as a result. Please resume your seat. Uh, Senator Hughes. Point of order, relevance. It was a very specific question. Is it true they will go from 90 to 95 per cent a family with $60,000? Thanks, Senator Ciccone. You should be the minister. Uh, Senator Hughes. Senator Rennick. I have reminded senators I did remind senators yesterday, and I'll remind senators again today. When you call a point of order, you simply state the point of order and then not get into argument or other statements. Uh, I do believe that the minister is being relevant. He's just started answering the question. There are a lot of interjections already the minute he stood, so it's quite difficult to hear him. Um, but uh, I am listening carefully. Thank you, Minister Watt. Thank you, President. Uh, as I was saying, I'm very happy about the fact that the Albanese Labor government will be delivering cheaper childcare to Australian families. Not just one family, not just two families, but 97 per cent of Australian families using the early childhood sector and childcare system will be better off as a result of our policy, something that you were not able to do in your first year, your second year, your third year, your fourth year, your fifth year, your sixth year, your seventh year, your eighth year or your ninth uh, year. Minister Watt, please resume your seat. Senator Hughes. Point of order on direct relevance. It was a very specific question that Thank the you. minister should be able to answer families on $60,000, uh, 90 to 95. Senator Hughes, there is no need to— Senator Hughes. You have asked me for a point of order. You may not agree with what I say, but I am the president and it's your job to make your point of order, sit down and then not further interject.
Uh, Senator Watt? That's right. Uh, Senator Watt, I would draw you back to the question. Thank you. Please continue. Thank you, uh, President. I'm happy to take the exact details of that question on notice for, for, the, um, for Senator Hughes. Um, the, uh, and I'm happy that she's showing an interest in this issue because I don't remember, I don't remember any opposition senator ever doing anything to support childcare in the way that the Labor government is doing. I, what I do remember, what I do remember, what I do remember, is the is the now opposition copying the policy of the Labor then opposition when it came to childcare, but not delivering that policy in full. And then for that reason, that policy what was then your policy, left a lot of Australian families much more out of pocket than ours were. Uh, That's Senator what I remember. Minister, please resume your seat. Please direct the minister to uh, actually answer the thank question. Thank you, Senator Hughes. I will remind uh, the minister. I know he's uh, agreed to take the question uh, on notice, but I... Okay. But I can, Senator, sorry. Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Hughes, Senator Hughes, resume your seat. I am not entertaining any further points of order from you on this matter. I have directed the minister to be relevant. Minister Book, Birmingham. Um, pre pre President, President on, on the points of, uh, points of order that have been taken, and indeed uh, Senator Watt's assertion while you were speaking before that uh, cavalierly that he still has 30 more seconds uh, with a tone that apparently means he can say whatever he likes. Um, just because he has taken the details on notice does not um, remove the obligation for him to be directly relevant to the question that has been asked and does not provide him with free licence to simply talk about the previous government, President. And I encourage you to draw him back uh, to the direct you. relevance of the question. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, uh, Senator Birmingham. You might recall I was in the process of responding to the point of order raised by Senator Hughes and Senator Hughes took it upon herself to interject again. So I've not been given the answer. I've not been given the opportunity to respond. I will draw Senator Watt back to the uh, question, and I would ask all senators to raise their points of order respectfully, and to sit down when asked to do so. Minister. Uh, thank you, President. Um, as I was saying, and I, I appreciate the opportunity to remind the chamber. Um, all Australian families who use the childcare system will be better off under the Labor policy that we will now implement than under the policies that existed under the former government. Uh, that, it took a change of government to deliver the cheaper childcare that Australian families so desperately need. There is one party that is delivering a cost of living benefit to Australians. It is Labor in childcare uh, thank and other you, areas. Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Hughes, first supplementary. Thank you, President. So, under Labor's proposed childcare changes, and I'm assuming you'll have to take this one on notice, but if you could stick to that, what will the increase in childcare subsidy be for a family earning $400,000? And is it true that the subsidy will now lift from zero to 27 per cent under Labor's proposal? Minister. Thank you, President. I, again, I'm happy to take the details of that question on notice for Senator Hughes. Uh, and I, I'm sure that uh, her colleagues in the House of Representatives are posing the same question to the actual minister to get that level of detail. Uh, if that's not occurring, perhaps she could have a chat to her colleagues about that. But um, I, think the, I think the other point to be noticed here is that, Order. as we have consistently said, President, uh, childcare is not simply a social welfare program. Childcare is not simply about economically supporting families who receive childcare benefits, as important as that is. Increasing childcare payments is an important economic uh, policy of this government to broaden particularly Senator women's McGrath. participation in the workforce. Having affordable childcare, regardless of income, is an important measure for this government to take uh, to increase women's participation in the, in the workforce. It is a shame that the former government didn't take the opportunity in any of the nine and a bit years that it was in government to do Thank the same thing. Thank you, Minister. Thing. Your time has expired. Senator Hughes, second supplementary. Now, whilst I appreciate the, uh, I'm sorry, the, the minister not been the minister, not my job minister, Senator Watt. Uh, is taken it on notice to actually get the figures. Some of us actually have had a look at these papers. So perhaps you may like to explain why, under Labor's much vaunted cost of living support, 
It is proposing to give more than five times the extra assistance to a family earning over $400,000 than Senator it does Hughes, to a family time earning for the question has expired, Minister. Thank you, President. There's nothing quite like being condescended to by Senator Hughes, is there, to make one's self-esteem feel even that much stronger. Um, whenever I'm Our feeling Minister, any degree of self-doubt— Minister, I'm waiting for silence. Uh, yeah, that was, I asked Hughes. the minister to withdraw. That was disparaging to me and to every woman in this place. He should withdraw. Uh, Senator Watt, if you think you were, if, if it would assist the chamber, if you withdrew. Well, I, if it would assist the chamber, I'm happy to withdraw. Thank I will point you. out that I was directing those remarks to only Senator Hughes uh, when it comes to condescending other people in this chamber. Senator. The, uh, but, but if Minister, I'm happy to withdraw if that assists the chamber. Seat, please. Uh, thank you. Thank you. When I ask people to either, in the interest of the chamber, to withdraw or to withdraw fully, I don't expect it to be done. I expect it to be done in a serious manner, and for no other commentary to um, be put with that. So, if you would um, consider the chamber and withdraw and move on. Thank you. In, in answer to Senator Hughes's uh, supplementary question, as I was saying in answer to the previous question, uh, something that the opposition seems to fail to grasp is that childcare payments are not only a social welfare measure. They are an important measure to encourage more women to participate in the workplace. We know that women's participation in the workplace is far lower than men's, and we know that increasing women's participation in the workplace is an important economic measure for this government. Oh, sorry. Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Ruskin. Uh, a point of order on clarification. Is the minister saying that uh, childcare is a social That's welfare measure? That's not a point measure? of order, Senator Ruston. Please continue. Uh, order, order. Interjections across the chamber are disorderly, Senator Ruston. Minister Watt, please continue. Thank you, uh, President. And if, if Senator Ruston requires me to repeat the point, the point I was making was that childcare payments are not only a social welfare measure, they are an economic development measure. Um, the Australian workforce needs more women you, Minister, and childcare payments will assist. Expired. Senator McKim. Our order. Senator McKim's got the call. Thank, uh, thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Minister, yesterday's national accounts showed that profits share of national income hit a new record high and that wages share of national income hit a new record low. This means that in the 60 years that the national accounts have been kept and published, never have business owners been getting a bigger slice of the pie and never have workers been getting a smaller slice of the pie. Will your government now finally accept that in the domestic context it is corporate profiteering that is a key driver of inflation and that wages are actually not driving inflation? Thank you, Senator McKim. Minister. Uh, thank you, um, President. And I thank Senator McKim uh, for the question on the national accounts and his ongoing interest in the economy. Um, I don't think we have ever, as the government said, I don't think we've ever said, uh, in response to the final part of, of your question, that wages have been driving inflation. I don't think anyone on this side of the chamber um, has been saying that at all. Um, on the broader question, there are some challenges that are clear in, in the national accounts which makes our economic plan even more important than ever to, to um, roll out uh, in relation to some of those issues we've seen in supply chains, in, in relation to some of the issues around productivity. Um, on, the, on the point of um, businesses and their profits, I mean, we want business to do well. We think it is important that business does well, but we've been on the record a number of times, including as a major part of our election campaign, the fact that we want to see wages moving. And that's why we have done absolutely everything we can since coming to government to make sure that we are supporting 
sensible and reasonable wage increases, um, particularly in areas like the minimum wage for people working on the lowest wages in the country and also in the area of aged care, where we're supporting the Fair Work Commission. We've got some work underway around workplace relations reform, which, as you know, um, the Senate will have to deal with at some point uh, later this year. Uh, but we are doing everything we can to make sure that working people, people are getting a decent pay rise. That has been one of the major failings in our economy over the last 10 years. It was because we had this mob over there had wage suppression as a deliberate design feature of their economic architecture. We are breaking down that architecture because we want to Thank see you, wages Minister, grow. Your time has expired. Senator McKim, first supplementary. Thank you, President. Uh, Minister, today uh, in his speech to the Annika Foundation, RBO, RBA Governor Dr Philip Lowe yet again failed to acknowledge the role of corporate profits in driving inflation. And I might um, reflect neither did you just then in your answer. Yet in July, Dr Lowe said workers should anchor their expectation of wage increases at 3.5 per cent, well below inflation. Are you comfortable with an RBA governor jawboning down wages but saying nothing about corporate profits? Thank you, Senator McKim. Minister. Uh, thank you, President. Well, I'd have to go back and have a look at. at I remember the governor saying, uh, making comments about wanting to see wages with a three in front of it, um, and I, I understand. And my recollection is he was saying that at a time when inflation was sitting below three percent, sitting probably in the order of 1.7 percent. So he, my recollection of that was that the governor was saying that the uh, wages were a handbrake on the economy, or slow wages growth was a handbrake on the economy. He wanted to see them get moving. We are now, of course, in a very different environment, and I've only had a, a short opportunity to have a look at um, uh, Governor Lowe's uh, remarks today in his speech. Uh, but I think he went through in that speech explaining, um, you know, I think he used the word surprise around um, the increase in the rate of inflation. Uh, and he, he certainly went through it in detail about um, the unexpected nature of that inflation surge and some of the reasons uh, behind that. Uh, but I think his record on wages has Thank been you, that— Thank you, Minister. Your time has Sorry. expired. Senator McKim, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Minister, last year Dr Lowe said that the RBA would not increase interest rates until wages' growth was materially higher. Real wages are going backwards, but the RBA has increased rates for five consecutive months after effectively telling Australians they would not go up until 2024. Do you agree that we need some accountability in the system, and do you agree that Dr Lowe you, has Senator got to McKim, go? Thank you, Senator McKim. Your time has expired, Minister. Uh, thank you. Um Madam President, in the minute available, there was a lot in that to unpack, but I, I strongly support the independence of the Reserve Bank and the long-standing convention uh, that the bank should not be interfered with by politicians. I think the review that underway is useful, and uh, Governor Lowe has, has made some comments on that uh, today. Uh, I think we are the, the Reserve Bank is doing uh, the work that they need to do to bring inflation down. Um, but the review will certainly assist all of us to ensure that the Reserve Bank uh, remains fit for purpose. And I think the governor has been accountable for the comments he's made and some of the decisions the bank uh, has made, uh, in, particularly in the last um, few months, in raising interest rates. I understand he's given this speech today. He's given a long press conference afterwards. So in that respect, um, he has been accountable for those decisions. Thank you, Minister. Senator Billick. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Wong. Yesterday, Australia and Timor-Leste signed a defence cooperation agreement. Can the Minister update the Senate on how the agreement will strengthen our defence relationship with Timor-Leste? Minister. Thank you, President. And I thank Senator Billick for her interest uh, in foreign policy and for her uh, question, uh, which does go to a very important issue about how Australia can work best with the countries of our region to support and promote our mutual security and sovereignty. 
So as we are, Australia is committed to supporting Timor-Leste security and sovereignty, including through our enduring defence cooperation. So the Albanese government was pleased to sign a defence cooperation agreement with Timor-Leste, and the agreement signed yesterday by our defence ministers is a status of forces agreement that sets out reciprocal protections, responsibilities and privileges each country will grant the military personnel of the other in its territory. It will allow both countries to increase defence and security cooperation, especially in the maritime domain, given our shared border and adjacent maritime zones. Uh, and this responded to particularly a priority that was expressed both publicly, uh, expressed publicly by the President Ramos Horta. It will announce our ability to operate together as required, conduct exercises and training, and cooperate on humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. I'm pleased to advise the Senate the agreement also means Timorese military members operating or exercising or training in Australia will receive the same protections, responsibilities and privileges as Australian personnel will receive in Timor-Leste. Australia welcomes this defence cooperation agreement. Uh, we acknowledge the contribution of the Timor-Leste government uh, and can I particularly acknowledge uh, my counterpart, Minister Magno, for her assistance in bringing this agreement to conclusion. The agreement provides the opportunity to deepen our close defence and security partnership with Timor-Leste. This is the government working to listen to our partners in the region and responding to their needs in order to maintain a stable, prosperous and peaceful region. Senator Billick, first supplementary. Thank you. How will the Albanese Labor government continue to help Timor-Leste build its economic resilience? Minister. Thank you, uh, President and uh, Senator Billick. Uh, thank you for that question because the economic resilience of Timor-Leste is uh, of great importance, not only to the people of, Timor, uh, of East Timor, uh, but to Australia, which has a, uh, you know, a, a stake uh, in uh, the Timor-Leste independence and sovereignty and obviously very close personal relationships and friendships between our two peoples. Uh, in the, my recent visit, I announced an additional $20 million in budget support for Timor-Leste to support its economic resilience and recovery from COVID-19. We are also on track to provide our first bilateral concessional loan for Timor-Leste for the development of Delhi Airport. We have a partnership to deliver a cyber, submarine fibre optic cable, the first such connection between Timor-Leste and Australia, and we continue to support Timor-Leste's ASEAN membership aspirations and its path to accession to the World Trade Organisation. We will continue to work with Timor-Leste. Thank you, Minister. The time has expired. Senator Billick, second supplementary. Thank you, uh, Minister Wong. It's great work that you're doing there. How does this agreement complement the Albanese Labor government's approach to strengthening our relationships across the region? Minister. <laughs> Thank you, uh, uh, President. Well, the, the government is looking to rebuild and strengthen our relationships in Southeast Asia and the Pacific. Uh, and as um, senators uh, may be aware, we, we've obviously uh, across government, but from my, whether it's the Prime Minister, myself, or the uh, other ministers, both cabinet and within the portfolio, we are actively engaging in the region. Uh, you know, what we hear from other nations in the region, from friends and partners, uh, is the value of genuine engagement, of respect, of listening, uh, and most importantly, that we want to engage in a region that recognises that we are, our futures are shared. Uh, these are challenging times in the world. Uh, we all understand that, but it's best that we navigate these challenges together, stronger together with our friends and our partners in the region. Uh, the region does value partnership, uh, and that is the approach that this government will continue to Thank take. Thank you, Minister. Senator Lambie. Thank you, um, Madam President. My question is for Minister representing the Assistant Treasurer, Minister Gallagher. APRA's review of super fund marketing expenditure found 12 funds spent $87 million on marketing between 2018 and 2020. Funds have a legal duty to spend members' money in a way that financially benefits the members. The regulator found funds had a lack of evidence that this spending can be justified. But instead of cleaning up this apparent waste of money, your government is cutting back on transparency over how this spending gets disclosed. 
Why are you making it easier for funds to spend the retirement savings of everyday Australians on billboards and TV ads promoting themselves when the regulator quite clearly says this money isn't delivering benefits to members? Thank you, Senator Lambie. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, uh, President, and I thank Senator Lambie for the question. Labor is committed to delivering accountability, transparency and good governance in every part of our financial system. Our world-class superannuation system is a massive success story, delivering $3.4 trillion in national savings and better retirement outcomes for Australians. Um, the, I think Senator Lambie is referring to the regulations that will come before this Senate around some changes uh, that were being made to streamline disclosure requirements for superannuation funds uh, and aligning those with the national accounting standards. Um, the new regulations will still require superannuation funds to disclose, um, in particular I in relation to any political donations, and they will ensure that the new regulations will have a high level of meaningful transparency for superannuation uh, members. Senator Lambie, first supplementary. Um, thank you, Madam President. This supplementary question is actually really simple. Under your draft and your members' meeting regulations, will it be easier or harder for members to identify specific payments their fund has made on advertising to industrial bodies and related parties? We just want to know, will it be easier or harder? Thank you, Senator Lambie. Minister. Well, um, I think the issue around the annual members' meetings is around um, uh, informing, you know, around process of holding those meetings. So the idea is that members are able to ask, or to ask for further information through those mechanisms. So I would say that they are still able, they are still able to uh, ask for that. Inf they, well, if they're, well, they're if they're interested in that, then they will know they they want to ask about it. Uh, and then they can ask for it through that process and have the information provided. Uh, Senator Lambie, second supplementary. Okay, I was going to do a point of order. Okay. Uh, the Assistant Minister has previously said these regulations need changing because the compliance costs for funds are too high. I just don't get it. Funds have to keep track of all their expenses and report the big number they add up to. So here's my question. How much extra would it cost exactly for funds to tell people what numbers they added up to get to their final figure? Thank you, Senator Lambie. Minister. Uh, thank you, um, Madam President. Well, if there are further information to provide to Senator Lambie, I will come back. Uh, I don't have a figure in front of me, but I do understand uh, that there that there um, is a view that aligning some of the requirements or or reducing red tape around these, but still allowing uh, requisite information that members will be after. Uh, is behind uh, the regulations that the uh, minister uh, has made. Um, I should say the, the regulations still uh, do require a level of information uh, to be provided through these annual members' meetings. I see, and the government sees no reason why I think it's any reduced transparency for members, but allows streamlined reporting in line with some of the other arrangements, including the Australian accounting standards. Uh, thank you, Minister. Senator Carr. Scar, sorry. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. I'll refer to the government's Code of Conduct for Ministers, Clause 3.11, Shareholding states, I quote, in recognition of the collective responsibility that ministers bear in relation to cabinet decisions, this code requires that ministers divest themselves of investments and other interests in any public or private company or business other than public superannuation funds or publicly listed managed funds or trust arrangements where, Roman II, the fund or trust does not invest to any significant extent in a business sector that could give rise to a conflict of interest with the minister's public duty. What is the definition of significant extent? Thank you, Senator Scar. Minister. Uh, thank you to, uh, thank you, President. Thank you to, 
thank you to the senator for the question. And he refers to a provision uh, in the code, which, as I said yesterday, uh, does not um, uh, did not exist under the government in which he he was a member. Um, I mean, it is. Um, Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Carr. Point of uh, point of order relevance. I asked a question specifically in relation to the ministerial code of conduct currently in place. There should be no need to refer to historical documents. Uh, thank you, Senator Scar. The minister has just uh, begun her response. Uh, I believe she is being relevant for the short time she's been on her feet, and I'll continue to listen. Thank you, Minister. Uh, thank you. Uh, and obviously, uh, any legal phrase uh, can be uh, is subject to you know, interpretation. But I think the intent is very clear. The intent is clear. This is because, unlike those opposite, we, we recognise the potential, or, and frankly, um, at times, inherent conflict of interest in ministers in a cabinet making decisions which. Um, uh, whilst owning shares. Uh, so we have set a, a higher standard, uh, and I appreciate um, that uh, the opposition want to, to probe the, uh, the merits of that. We do think it's appropriate. Uh, it's in recognition of the collective responsibility that uh, members of cabinet or members of the executive bear in relation to, th to decisions. And uh, unlike uh, what has gone before for the last decades. We, you know, it was the Prime Minister's view, uh, shared by uh, his cabinet, that it is important that divestment is the way in which um, these matters are ultimately resolved. In. And, and as you would have seen in the media, and I know the opposition have asked questions about this, uh, that is what is taking place. Senator Scar, first supplementary. We'll add that to net zero. In question time yesterday, in response to a question from Senator Hume, Senator Wong said, it is the Prime Minister's expectation that ministers do comply with the code. He, he is the Prime Minister, made that clear both privately and publicly. On what occasions has the Prime Minister privately made his expectations clear to each of Minister Shorten and McBain and Assistant Ministers Ayres and Kearney? Thank you, Senator Scar. Minister. Uh, thank you. I, I am <laughs> I'm certainly not going to go into every discussion the Prime Minister has, and nor would you would, no, no, nor would you expect me to. My, my, my remarks went to the standard that is, respect, is, has, is being expected. And I would say to you, questions have been asked in relation to a number of the ministers to which you refer uh, in the House in this week, and have, they have been appropriately answered. Now, I know that doesn't satisfy your thirst for some political hits, but they have been appropriately answered in the House. And I again say, Australians will look at you asking these questions, recognising that you never set such a standard for yourselves. You never set such a standard for yourselves. And we saw over the nine years in your government the number of ministers who did have shares in companies which may have been affected uh, by decisions of the federal cabinet. Thank you, Minister. Senator Scar, second supplementary. Thank you, President. I think it uh, is more pertinent, pertinent to ask whether or not it satisfied the code of conduct as opposed to me. Minister, has the Prime Minister requested you or had any discussions with you about ministers or assistant ministers who have breached or may be in breach of the ministerial code of conduct? Thank you, Senator Scar. Minister. Uh, no, uh, and what the Prime Minister has said publicly uh, reflects his private position, which is his expectations are that all of us comply with the Ministerial Code of Conduct. Uh, Senator Babette. My question is to Minister Wong, representing the Prime Minister. Can the Minister name one country in the world where a higher share of solar and wind power has led to lower electricity prices? Thank you, Senator Babette. Minister. Well, uh, I'd make the point. Uh, thank you to um, the senator for the question. Uh, and I, I would say to him that uh, it is not a, a highly contested position uh, by most who look at the energy market in Australia that the cheapest new form of generation is clean energy. Uh, and in fact, there is a, a live market experiment for that, and that is the state of the electricity market the, today. Uh, we, we, we have four, four gigawatts exiting 
uh, uh, one coming in during the, the life of the previous government. I, I think those, those are the figures I, I recall. Uh, Senator, Senator McAllister will tell me if I'm wrong, uh, which reflects the lack of certainty in the market uh, um, and the lack of certainty as a consequence of the, the, those opposites' failure to deal with their internal divisions as they do today. Um, Minister. Uh, Senator Canavan. Thank you, Madam President. Just a point of order on relevance. Uh, uh, this is becoming a pattern. Uh, from um, uh, Senator, Senator Canavan, Wong. I don't well, need well, the statement. Is, well, my, my, what my is point your of point? Order, my point of order on relevance uh, is the question was clearly about whether a country in the world has experienced lower prices, yet Minister Wong, uh, as uh, I say, is in a pattern, is going back I to talk about the previous government's record. Thank Nothing you, to Senator do with the question. Senator Canavan, please resume your seat. Uh, I do believe the minister is being relevant. It is a broad topic, and uh, she is within the realm of the question, Minister. Uh, look, I'm, Senator Babbitt, I'm happy to look at and uh, ask the minister I'm representing if there are examples around the world of what we also see in Australia, which is that renewable energy is the cheapest form of new generation capacity. I don't think that's a, that, that is an unremarkable proposition, a proposition that is shared by uh, uh, those who you know, manage our electricity system as well as the business community. Uh, so I, I, I respect that you know, Senator Canavan is you know, uh, very clear in his interjections about his views on this issue. They're not shared, as I understand it, by the remainder of the coalition. Uh, but, uh, we see, uh, as do business, benefit to Australian consumers from certainty that enables the investment in renewable energy in order to ensure we have a system which is, has greater supply uh, and relative, relatively lower prices. Thank you, Minister. Senator Babette, first supplementary. Thank you, um, President. Um, the, the minister has just referred to renewables as the cheapest form of energy just now. Now, in June this year, the Australian energy market operator found that on a per capita basis in 2018-2019, Australia added four to five times the solar and wind generation of any of the European Union, the USA, Japan or China. Now, if Australia is installing more of the so-called cheapest oh, forms sorry, of power— Sorry, Senator Babette, your time has expired. <laughs> um, Minister. Well, I, I, I'll try and do my best. I'm not sure where you got to in the end of the question, uh, but I, I think I— I think I understand um, the, the government of the question, and if I don't, I'm sure the senator can follow it up with a supplementary. Uh, but the proposition that we can simply stay with our ex uh, our, the old coal-fired power uh, electricity generation, and that's going to give us cheaper energy, is just no longer the case. And you know how we know that? Because no private sector entity wanted to invest in new, new coal-fired power. Well, private sector. I know Matt did. Senator Canavan did, but, <laughs> but, but, but my point is the market showed us. Now, now Senator Babette, I, I do recall your first speech talking about the benefits of the free market. And what I'd say to you is the free market has spoken on this. The free market has spoken on this, and it hasn't gone down the path Senator Canavan wanted. Thank you, Minister. Senator Babette, second supplementary. Order. Order. <laughs> Order, Senator Babette has. Thank you, Senator Babette. Last year, the Biden administration banned imports of key solar panel material from Chinese-based Hoshine Silicon Industry Co. because they were involved with the forced labour of Uyghurs in China. Will the government take similar action to restrict the importation of solar panels made from forced labour from the CCP? 
Thank you, Senator Babette. Minister. Uh, thank you, President. That, and that is a very good question, Senator Babette, <coughs> and one, one that I, about which I am deeply concerned, as is everyone on this side. And that is why we went to the last election with a position to strengthen the Modern Slavery Act and regulation yeah, within yeah, our yeah. economy. Because whether it's from Xinjiang, as the, as the, the senator has referenced, or elsewhere in the world, uh, and you know from the work that Walk Free and others have done that forced labour, which we regard in our heads as something of the past, is something of the present. Uh, and we should do what the, those opposite failed to do in government, in fact voted against, uh, provisions to strengthen the Modern Slavery Act here in Australia. We should be, uh, we should be clear about ensuring that we require companies to be uh, far more careful in assuring, assuring their supply chains uh, and that we do not allow uh, our purchases uh, unknowingly uh, to condone uh, forced labour anywhere in the world. Thank you, Minister. Senator Still. Yes, thank you, President. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Emergency Management, Senator Watt. Uh, how is the government working to improve Australia's resilience response and recovery ahead of the 2022-23 high-risk weather season. Minister. And thank you, Senator Verstel, uh, who I know has been very interested in this topic in WA, Cyclone Saroja and other events as well. Uh, in recent years, we've seen the increasing impacts of climate change on our communities and our environment. From the most savage bushfires our country has ever seen to some of the most devastating floods on record. As our climate changes and natural disasters become more common, the way in which we manage our emergency response needs to change as well. Unlike those opposite, we are committed to acting on climate change, both through reducing our emissions and by supporting those communities most impacted by the effects of climate change. The bill we've just passed today is an important part of reducing those emissions and better preparing for future disasters also protects communities as well. As a country and as a government, we need to be better prepared and we need to respond more quickly to natural disasters. Unfortunately, when those opposite were in power, they did neither, and that left Australians exposed. If we are asking Australians to be better prepared for natural disasters, then our government needs to do the same thing. And that's why last week I formally launched the National Emergency Management Agency, or NEMA, bringing together the capabilities of Emergency Management Australia and the National Recovery and Resilience Agency into a single agency. NEMA will bring together the capabilities of both agencies to provide support, prepare for the future disasters, lead the response when disaster strikes and remain deeply connected with communities during recovery. It simply made no sense to have two separate disaster agencies in two different departments reporting to two different ministers, which was the situation we had under the former government. Bringing these agencies together as one, NEMA, will provide better coordination at a national level and ensure that we are better prepared for natural disasters and respond more quickly. Good governments plan for the best and prepare for the worst, and now NEMA will be a big part of that. NEMA will work side by side with state, territory and local governments Thank you, Minister. Your from beginning time to has end. Expired. Senator Stolf, first supplementary. As the Senate, what concrete steps the Albanese government is taking to prepare communities for future natural disasters? Minister. Thank you again, Senator Stirl. Uh, yesterday in the House of Representatives, the Albanese government introduced amendments to the Disaster Ready Fund legislation. These amendments will ensure that $200 million a year allocated in the fund is spent on disaster mitigation while maintaining our commitment to support communities as they recover from disasters. I think members on both sides of this chamber will remember the comments that I had to make about the former government's emergency response fund, set up over three years ago with the support of the then opposition, with $4 billion in it, set up to spend money every year on disaster mitigation and disaster recovery. And by the time we got to the election after three years, it hadn't built a single disaster mitigation project and hadn't released a single cent out of disaster for disaster recovery. We're determined to change that, and I'm happy to report that this legislation has been welcomed by stakeholders across the community, from the Insurance Council of Australia and Suncorp to the RACQ and the Local Government Association of Queensland. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Senator Stoll, second supplementary. Thank you. Well, there is a great focus on floods at the moment. We know that parts of the country will experience bushfire. What is being done to prepare these communities, Minister? Minister. Uh, Senator Stirl and the President are both interested in this because WA, of course, experienced bad bushfires again last year. 
Uh, I've recently been briefed by the Bureau of Meteorology about what they are forecasting for the upcoming high-risk weather season, and members of parliament and senators were invited to a similar briefing this week as well. It's true that while there is a very high chance of, of a third La Nina this summer, bringing more rain and flooding to the east coast states, and we need to be ready for that, in addition, in central and western Australia, communities are facing increased chances of bushfire. That's why last week I met with AFAC, who coordinate the National Aerial Firefighting Centre, and they've assured me that the resources available to them are appropriate for this season and that preparedness activities are on schedule. And that may well include the redeployment of some aerial firefighting units to the west. Also last week, the new Australian Fire Danger Rating System was launched. This is a once in a generation change to how the sector forecasts and warns about fire danger. Unlike our predecessors, the Albanese government is looking over Thank the horizon, Minister, ensuring we're better prepared. Senator Nampajinka Price. Thank you, Madam President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Indigenous Australians, Senator Gallagher. Given today's announcement that the Labor government has appointed a working group on The Voice, can the Minister advise the Senate if this working group will confirm the membership of The Voice? the selection process for The Voice and powers of The Voice prior to the proposed referendum? Uh, Minister. Uh, do you have anything on that? Uh, thank you, President. Um, uh, I think those are matters uh, that the minister will be dealing with. I understand there is a meeting uh, tomorrow. Uh, and uh, those matters are firmly within her areas of responsibility. Um, this will be an important group. Um, I heard. Sorry, it is a very important. Well, uh, thank you. I think this is. A... I think this is a very important group, uh, dealing with an an issue um, around. Uh, constitutional recognition, a, a voice to parliament that um, is one I think that we should all engage in. There is an opportunity here to do something uh, nation building, uh, something inclusive, uh, something that wrongs of, uh, or rights a previous wrong. Uh, and a lot of, and a lot of work thought. needs to be done. This Senate has a role to play in that, about listening to different opinions finding where Senator there is Thorpe. shared agreement to progress this issue that is important to so many Australians, including so many First um, Nations Senator Australians. Senator Gallagher, please resume your seat. Um, Senator Wong. I'd ask you to draw Senator Thorpe to order. Uh, Senator Thorpe, I, uh, was, I did not hear any comments you made. Order! But uh, your constant interjections are disorderly, and uh, I would ask you to, Senator Mackenzie, at the time that I'm calling another senator to order for being disorderly, you yourself are disorderly. I would call senators to order and to listen to the answers to the question, Minister. Uh, thank you, um, President. What I was saying was that this, the referendum working group will be an important part of implementing a First Nations voice uh, to parliament. Uh, we want to progress it in a way that brings people together, understanding that there are different views about how to progress this, uh, but there is an opportunity here to work together <coughs> to do Senator something Thorpe. meaningful and respectful to progress reconciliation and to ensure that we deliver on some of uh, the, uh, well, on all of the Uluru Statement from the Heart in an organised and respectful way. Thank you, Minister. Your time way. has expired. Um, Senator Nampajinka Price, first supplementary order. Order. Um, Senator Wong, um, order. Order. I would invite those senators who are constantly interjecting to put their hands up to ask questions when it's their opportunity to do so. But your constant interjections are disorderly. And Senator Thorpe, I've called you to order. It's not your chance to debate this. Um, Senator Nampajinka Price, first supplementary. Can the government outline how free, prior and informed consent will be obtained by Aboriginal Australians during this new group's engagement activities, given the body will form the basis of the Yes campaign for a referendum. 
Thank you, Senator Nampajinka Price. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, um, Madam President. And again, I repeat um, the answer I gave to the last question, which is about the referendum working group uh, being an important part of implementing the First Nations uh, voice to parliament. It will assist the government and provide advice to the government. Uh, we have, um, in terms of the referendum working group, we have the minister, Linda Burney, working with Senator Pat Dodson on that, uh, with a whole range of other um, highly eminent Australians. Well, I'm, not, I'm not going to argue with that, you on that, Senator Thorpe. They are highly eminent Australians. Yeah. First, first uh, rate Australians on this group. Senators, absolutely. Interjections across the chamber are disorderly. Um, Senator Nampajinka Price. In of order to relevance, um, specific to uh, the question of how free, prior, informed consent will be obtained. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Nampajinka Price. I do believe uh, the minister is being relevant, and I'll ask her to continue, Minister. Well, my point is that this is the working group will work through a whole range of issues in formulating their advice and, and progressing the implementation of this commitment. That is the job, and that is why it's thank being you, formed. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Nampajinka Price, second supplementary. Can the minister outline how much the new working group on the proposed voice model is costing taxpayers, including the expenditure already allocated to the National Indigenous Australians Agency on developing the model? Thank you, Senator Nampajinka Price, Minister. Uh, thank you. Uh, there are costs associated with um, progressing uh, the voice uh, to parliament. Um, there was provision made for some of this uh, by the previous government uh, when, or when, they were, when New Lock were in power, so there was some money put aside in the budget. We expect, we, we, we expect there will be some additional investments. We see them as investments rather than costs uh, that go to making sure that we do this properly, that we bring people together, that we unite a nation uh, and that we do it properly. Uh, that is why so much work is going in to making sure that the engagement mechanisms and the working Order. group uh, is able to have all of the conversations they need to have to bring people together to make sure that we do this in a way that unites the country rather than divides it. If there are additional costs, they will be Order. in the budget. Uh, Senator Wong. Thank you, President. I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Uh, and sad. Oh, that's not true. I just have. Uh, I have two. Uh, at the conclusion of question time yesterday, I'm sorry. In question time yesterday, I undertook to provide further information in response to questions asked of me by Senator Hume in my capacity as Minister representing the Prime Minister, Prime Minister relating to the Minister for Regional Development, Local Government and Territories. I have written to the Senator to provide additional information, and I table my letter to Senator Hume for the information of all Senators. Can I also indicate, in the course of question time, uh, Senator Payne, or well, the lead of the Opposition, advised me that Senator Payne told uh, in fact, visited Timor Leste in August of 2019. Uh, so I correct the record in that answer. Uh, Senator Watt. Uh, thank you, President. Uh, I'd just like to provide answers to the questions I took on notice from Senator Hughes today. Uh, I'm advised that a family with one child earning $60,000 a year currently faces out-of-pocket costs of $2,430 a year. Under Labor's cheaper childcare plan, they will pay only $1,620 out of pocket per year. A family with one child earning $400,000 a year faces current out of pocket costs uh, of $16,000, and under the Albanese government's plan, they will pay about $12,000. Under the government's plan, 96 per cent of Australian families with children in childcare will be better off. This is a cost of living measure with an economic dividend. It will help get women back into the workforce, unlocking an army of skilled workers our economy is crying out for. It's good for kids, it's good for families, and it's good for the economy. Senator, Senator Patterson, and then I'll go to Senator Scar. Um, thank you, Mr Deputy President. Um, I seek an explanation from the Minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs, Senator Watt, 
of the Minister's failure to answer questions on Notice 99 and 100, which are now overdue. But in doing so, I acknowledge I only give, gave him about 10 minutes' notice of my intention to do so. So I will not be surprised if he doesn't have the answers on him, but I uh, seek his assistance in achieving a timely resolution to these questions. Senator Watt. Uh, thanks, uh, Deputy President. Um, thank you uh, to Senator Patterson for the heads up on this. Uh, I will, of course, seek an explanation from the minister and uh, respond uh, to the chamber. Senator Scar. Mr Deputy President, uh, I rise to take note of the answer by Senator Wong to the question which I asked previously today. And in doing so, might I say that I'm absolutely gobsmacked by what is transpiring as we sit here today in the lower house with respect to the uh, investments and the disclosures made by the Attorney General, Mr Dreyfus MP. It is absolutely extraordinary what is, what is, what is happening in terms of this issue in the lower house. And there was, in history, a famous affair called the Dreyfus Affair, going back in history, in relation to Captain Dreyfus, who was wrongly accused of doing the wrong thing back in the time of the, about the turn of the century, early 20th century. But it will be very interesting to see. It will be very interesting to see where this, how this unravels. Because what we're finding out, what we're finding out, is that the Attorney General appears through his self-managed super fund to have held a material interest, or have held an interest in a, a managed fund called Greenscape, which holds just over 9% of the shares. 9% of the shares or about $100 million worth in a, in a company known as Omni Bridgeway, which provides class action litigation funding. This is extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary. The Attorney General. And I asked a question of Senator Wong in relation to the definition of the Ministerial Code of Conduct, where it clearly says, clearly says that the fund or trust must not invest to any significant extent in a business sector that could give rise to a conflict of interest with the minister's public duty. So the Attorney General is not permitted under the Ministerial Code of Conduct to have an interest in a fund which invests in an entity which has a material potential conflict with the discharge of his duties. And here we have the Attorney General of the country, through his self-managed super fund, has an investment in a fund called Green Cake which actually, has, which actually has a material interest in a class action litigation funder. This wow. is extraordinary stuff. This is extraordinary stuff. This could be the end of this Attorney General. It is extraordinary. And I say this as someone in a previous life was a company secretary and used to have responsibility of oversight of the company's share trading policy. And I can tell you, in terms of interpreting significant extent, from, a, from a, general, a general application in the corporation's world, an interest of 5 per cent is con considered material. 5 per cent is considered material. And in fact, any increase over 5 per cent in, in increments of 1 per cent has to be released to an Australian stock exchange in an announcement. And in fact, in fact it's considered a substantial shareholding. So here we have a situation where the federal attorney general through a self-managed superannuation fund, has an interest in a fund which owns 9 per cent of a litigation funder. This is extraordinary. This is extraordinary. I don't see how he gets a way out of this. I don't see a way through this for the Attorney General. On a plain reading of the Ministerial Code of Conduct, he's in breach, clear breach. And this is not de minimis. This isn't a few hundred bucks, a little 1 per cent here or there. This is an interest in his self-managed super fund, which holds an interest in a fund that holds 9 per cent of a litigation funder, the Attorney General. You don't get away from that. You don't get away from that. And of all the ministers, of all the ministers, I can excuse to some extent Assistant Minister Ayres, but for the Attorney General, the Attorney General to actually have such a have, have, it appears, on the face of it, and I'm looking at the article from the Age newspaper, James Masola, 8 September 2022, 2.42 p.m., this is extraordinary. The Dreyfus Affair. This will be known as the Dreyfus Affair. And just as Captain Dreyfus ended up on the literal Devil's Island in French Guinea, 
I, I suspect that the Attorney General, Mark Dreyfus, is going to end up in the Devil's Island of the Ministerial Code of Conduct. You don't, get, you don't come back from this. You don't come back from this. This is a material interest. This is a significant interest. That's what the code says. Senator Wong said it's all about intention. It's all about intention. Yes, it is. It is. And I expect the Attorney General, the first law officer in this nation, to actually discharge his responsibilities and understand the significance. Nine per cent. He owns an interest in a fund that owns nine per cent in a litigation funder. Absolutely extraordinary. The Dreyfus Affair, 2022. Senator Pratt. Mr Acting Deputy President, in question time today, where we hear from Senator Scar, these remarks about our Attorney General, when his own government set practically no standard at all, not only in terms of ministerial accountability. Senator. Well, no, I, I'm quite happy. I, I don't want to be interjected on while I'm making my remarks through you, uh, Mr. President. We have uh, looked at the, uh, this debate. These questions that have been asked of Mr. Dreyfus. He has been. Uh, uh, he has disclosed in his uh, uh, Senate uh, members' interests everything that is required of him. On the other hand, we have seen countless episodes from members in the Liberal Party where we've been unable even even to have a public debate about the nature of a conflict of interest because they have squirrelled and hidden away their interests and their vested interests. Mark Dreyfus, our Attorney-General, has, has been absolutely clear and transparent about his interests, and he has said very clearly that he expects uh, to, have, uh, to divest those interests if, if uh, it should be satisfied that there is a perception of a conflict of interest according to the requirements of the code. This high standard that the Attorney-General has set and that this government has set is not a standard that those opposite were ever prepared to hold themselves to. There is not even a provision in the code of the previous government that would see someone divesting themselves of the shares in the code uh, because of any perceived conflict of interest. We've seen this over and over again. Those opposite have had inherent conflicts of interest as ministers in the cabinet making decisions whilst owning shares. We have set a high standard, and there's nothing wrong with probing the merits of that here in question time. That's fine. That's appropriate. But we have a collective responsibility in this place, be we uh, senators, members of uh, the executive or not, to bear in mind uh, what has gone on for decades before. We are pursuing, uh, under the Prime Minister, a divestment process where these matters are ultimately asked about, and that is indeed what is taking place. Those opposite never held themselves to account in such a way. Senator Wong, in responding to those uh, questions, was very clear in what she said. The minister outlined that those questions have been asked about a number of ministers uh, in the House this week and that they have been indeed appropriately answered based on the accountability uh, of the ministerial standards. 
I liked Senator Wong's uh, uh, colour and flavour in her answer, where our leader said, that doesn't uh, satisfy your thirst for some political schutzpah, that we should have such straightforward, clear, transparent processes. It's all very well for those opposite to seek to try and get some political mileage out of this when they have never, ever sought to set a decent standard at all. You know, to that end, under the last government, we did not ever see a national anti-corruption commission that could also have oversight as such matters. We are very clear and positive in our duty to introduce legislation to establish a powerful, transparent and independent national anti-corruption commission in the next session of parliament. Thank you, Senator Pratt. Senator Smith. Thank you indeed. Thank you very much, Senator Pratt. Senator Pratt would like to use 100 days or 100 days plus since the federal election to talk about the last 10 years. But let me make this statement. There is no virtue in raising ministerial standards, raising the bar of ministerial standards, if you're only going to lower the bar on compliance. And that is exactly what's happened. We have had a situation where the Labor Party, in seeking government, made much of the virtue of lifting standards of integrity in our country. I agree with that. Standards of integrity in our parliament and in our country need to be lifted. And indeed, I'm on the public record as supporting a federal integrity commission, and I'll look with great interest when the government delivers its, its bill. But the Labor Party made much virtue of coming to government wanting to raise the integrity standards. Indeed, in the Ministerial Code of Conduct, which contains Anthony Albanese's signature, he says, Australians deserve good government. The Albanese government is committed to integrity, honesty and accountability, and ministers in my government, including assistant ministers, hold that thought, including assistant ministers, will observe standards of probity, governance and behaviour worthy of the Australian people. That's what the Prime Minister not just said, but signed off on in the Ministerial Code of Conduct. <coughs> Labor is confused about integrity. It says we're committed to integrity because we're going to have a National Integrity Commission. But in the first 100 days, it seeks to abolish the mechanism for establishing in integrity on our construction work sites. It says we're going to abolish the construction industry watchdog. Then it says it's going to remove measures of transparency introduced by the coalition over the superannuation industry. On one day, they want to be committed to integrity, but on the following days, they do, by their actions, remove mechanisms of integrity in our country. Wow. And then we've had three parliamentary sitting weeks, just three parliamentary sitting weeks, and we now have five ministers, five ministers, including assistant ministers, who are now in breach of a ministerial code signed by the Prime Minister himself. We are seeing a Congo line of Labor ministers in breach of the ministerial standards. In this place, Senator Ayres, the Assistant Minister for Trade. In the other place, Mr Mill Shorten, the Minister for Government Services and the National Ind Disability Insurance Scheme. We've heard comments in regards to the Assistant Minister for Health and Aged Care. Add to that the Minister for Regional Development, Local Government and Territories. Just three weeks of sittings and already one plus two plus three plus four five ministers five members of the executive government add to that as senator add to that senator scar's contribution on the latest development in just the last 45 minutes in regards to the attorney general mr dreyfus labor said at the election that it would make permanent 
and much needed changes to standards of integrity and accountability in government. Labor said it would have the lowest tolerance, the lowest tolerance for poor integrity standards in government. Judge Labor not on what they said, but on now what they do. Some senators in this place have tried to make a virtue of the fact that Mr Albanese, in his ministerial code of conduct, has said, we're going to do better. We're going to do better. Well, the measure of integrity is not what you're going to do, but the standard in which you apply to those new measures. Mr Albanese, as the new Prime Minister, would do well to learn the lessons of past leaders in our country. And we would hope our great ambition is that in every day, every week, every year, the standards of integrity in our parliament, in our community are lifted. But these breaches of the ministerial code are a dangerous precedent and they deserve a stronger response from the Prime Minister. Senator Polly. Yes, thank you. Look, it never ceases to amaze me that senators from the opposition can come in and try and lecture the new Labor government about integrity. The, for, the uh, former speaker talked about learning from past leaders. Well, I can say one thing for sure, that those people on this side and the Prime Minister, uh, Anthony Albanese, will not take any lessons from Scott Morrison, from Malcolm Turnbull or Tony Abbott. We have set a very high standard when it comes to ministerial code of conduct. We also have set out our plan to the Australian people when it comes to legislating a national anti-corruption commission. We will deliver on that. But let's not forget that the integrity of a government doesn't just lie with a ministerial code of conduct. Let's not forget the waste and rot, and that's clearly what they were. They were wrought by the former government. So the hypocrisy of those on that side to come into this chamber and try and sing their virtues of we did nothing wrong. Let's also talk about the dishonesty that they continue to perpetuate in this place in relation to the trillion dollar debt that they have left. This hasn't been left just to the Australian government, the Albanese Labor government. This is a debt that has been bestowed on the Australian people. And to come into this chamber as they do and trying to say this was all about the pandemic is quite wrong. It is, in fact, a lie. A lie. Let's also not forget the $20 billion in JobKeeper money that was paid to companies who profited. profited. Let's not forget about the integrity and the lack of honesty of those when they were in government in relation to the billions of dollars that were spent on the French submarines. But there were no subs. No subs. But what they did deliver was a blow to the French government and the relationships between the two countries, which, again, because of our government's integrity, because of the leadership of the Prime Minister, we have gone about renewing and restoring that relationship. Let's also not forget, because I think this is, this is one that will stay in the Australian psyche for such a long, long time, and that is the $660 million car park rorts. Car park rorts. They were going to build these car parks where there was no trains. Now, if you want to come in here and lecture us about integrity and, and standards, then those people in glass houses should not, should not throw stones. And let's also go back to the, what was it? A hundred million dollar sports rorts. Sports rorts. 
And these are the same people that come into this chamber, as they did today in question time and, and the contributions, and I, I know there'll be a further contribution from those on the other side. But let's get real here. Do you really think that the Australian people are going to put their faith in what you say in terms of the standards that your government set and that they would want to measure ours against those? Because they will not. They will not. Now, I know it takes a little while to get used to opposition and we're not very happy because today we've passed climate change, another election uh, commitment that we took to the federal election, and so they're all a bit sore and a bit na bit narky today, and I guess it's been a, another long week, and uh, the former senator respond, uh, reminded us we've only um, had three weeks of sitting. Well, the reality is the Albanese Labor government is setting a standard, a very high standard, and one that we will work with to make sure that our standards are upheld. But our standard is so much higher than anything that uh, you did when you were in government. And even that very low standard that you had was never, ever met. Thank you. Senator Van. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy President. Wow. We just heard uh, about this side of politics uh, being Solving. depressed yeah. after uh, losing an election. Now, we all know parties lose elections from time to time. When I first came into this place in 2019, what we saw on the other side was, uh, how did uh, Senator Cormann put it, the seven stages of grief being displayed each and every day. Now, what you can't say about this side of the chamber is our tails are up. We're positive. We're fighting. We're holding the, the, this government to account every time, every day. And if we had more sitting days, you'd be seeing more being held to account than possible. And today, and people ask why we need to hold them to account. Well, we just learned of our fifth example today. We just learned of our fifth example today of the Attorney General, Mr. Dreyfus. Wow, the leading law officer of the land can't even get right understanding what significant extent means in the ministerial code. Now, maybe it's okay for a foreign minister not to know what significant extent means. Maybe it's okay for uh, Senator Ayres not to know what it means. You know, he is just the assistant minister for trade. But for the attorney general not to know what the term significant, significant extent means, well, well, it would. It would go down in writing and it is you know, codified in very many places. In law, in law, so you'd think that our primary, our number one legal officer in the land would have some extent, uh, uh, knowing some idea of what significant extent means. It's talking about materiality. It's not talking about oh, a little bit there or a little bit there. It has an actual meaning. And that meaning is written in the ministerial code that the Prime Minister himself has signed. <laughs> as my good friend Senator Smith has shown us today. You know, the other side keep on talking about integrity, but talk is cheap. And we're seeing that daily from this government, that they want to talk about integrity. They want to talk about parliament being a better place. They want to talk about it more family friendly. Yet, you know, last night we saw with the uh, help of the Greens, you know, they guillotine debate. The Greens even guillotined their own disallowance motion. They just got, got rid of their own disallowance motion. Like, really? This is, what, this is what's been you know, shown as transparency and a better parliament? I don't think so. Even the comments to my, my good friend Senator Hughes today in question time shows that the way this government is acting towards people, particularly women in parliament, shows no respect. So there's no respect for parliament. There's no respect even for their own code of conduct. This is just an, an incredible show of hubris. You know, that they can come in here and they'll talk about, you know, this code and transparency and integrity. 
and apparently we're going to see uh, an integrity commission come before the, the parliament sometime soon. Well, do we know when? Yes, we don't know when. You know, they signed a, uh, an agreement with Timo Leste yesterday. Now, I tried to get a copy of that, um, that cooperative defence agreement. It's not available. So there is no transparency from this government. You know, let alone what's happening with their, uh, their ministerial code of conduct, which seems to be, I think, as they what do they say in the Pirates of Caribbean, more of a, uh, a, a, a something you lean to rather than something to be observed in the obvious. So we're not going to take lectures from those on that side about what and what isn't integrity. We will look at what, not what they say. We will look at what they do. And we will ask them to be transparent, and we'll demand that they're transparent, and we'll hold them to account in question time, in take note, and in a few short weeks in Senate estimates. The Senate estimates, I might say, has been cut down a budget estimate, which has been cut down from the normal two weeks or eight days to uh, five days or six days. Like they're not even going to allow us to hold them to account during Senate estimates. Now, I'm just waiting for them to cut the hours of Senate estimates as well to be a little bit more family friendly. But it won't be transparent and won't be. Thank you, Senator integrity. Van. I put the question. Those for the question say aye. Against no, the ayes have it. Senator McKim. Well, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Uh, I uh, move that the Senate take note of the response uh, to my question from Senator Gallagher. Now, yesterday the ABS released the national accounts, and the national accounts showed that profits share of national income hit a new record high, and that wages share of national income hit a new record low. These, Acting Deputy President, are astonishing statistics. In the more than 60 years since records have been kept, never have businesses been getting a bigger slice of the pie and never have workers been getting a smaller slice of the pie. Workers are back, in terms of their share of national income, to where they were 60 years ago. 60 years and no progress. And what did the RBA governor have to say about this astonishing statistic in a speech he gave today? Nothing. Silence. Absolutely nothing. In fact, the word profit wasn't even mentioned once. Instead, what Dr Lowe did is do what he's been doing so well this year, and that is running cover for corporate Australia. Here's what he said today, and I'll quote from his speech. Business people are able to stand in the public square and say they're putting their prices up, and they can point to a number of reasons why. The community doesn't like it, but there is begrudging acceptance. And with prices rising, it is harder to resist bigger wage increases, especially in a tight labour market. Now, this is truly gobsmacking stuff from Dr Lowe. You've got corporate profits at record highs, you've got wages at record lows, and yet Dr Lowe is making up excuses for businesses to put up prices. Just another high priest, Just another high priest of neoliberal economics, as my colleague Senator, Jordan, uh, Senator Steele John says. And uh, Dr Lowe is at the same time selling the fantasy of wage increases coming down the line. Well, I wish he was right, but I don't expect that he is. He's blabbing on about the RBA's business liaison program, and he's ignoring the fact that, that wage rises are a fantasy, in part because Dr Lowe himself spends a fair bit of his time jawboning down wages in July this year. He told workers they need to anchor their wage increase expectations at 3.5 per cent, while at the same time saying inflation was going to be higher. Well, real wages are where they were 10 years ago in this country, and you've got the RBA governor out there making the case for real wages to go even further backwards. This is truly Alice in Wonderland stuff. 
It's hard to make sense of at times, but I did see one distillation of the situation that I thought had significant merit. It was a tweet from uh, Mr David Taylor, who's uh, a reporter with the ABC's program The Drum. And Mr Taylor tweeted this out after Dr Lowe's speech. How did we get to the point where it's OK for the RBA governor to, one, to warn publicly against rising wage growth without mentioning record profits? We know profits are contributing to the vast bulk of inflation. Real wages are going backwards. I just don't get it, said uh, Mr Taylor. Well, Mr Taylor, I just don't get it either. I don't get it either. And you know who else I reckon doesn't get it? That's the vast majority of the Australian people whose purchasing power is going backwards and yet they just got smashed by a 50 basis points interest rate rise from the Reserve Bank, smashing mortgage holders, smashing renters, smashing small business owners to try and uh, allegedly get on top of inflation, which is actually not domestically being driven by wages, it's being driven by corporate profits. And I asked the minister today to acknowledge, and this is not for the first time, I might add, that I've asked the minister today to acknowledge the role corporate profiteering and price gouging is playing in driving inflation, and yet again the minister would not, in her response, acknowledge the role that corporate, corporate profits are playing in driving inflation. We need truth, we need accountability in the system, and we're not getting it. I put the question, those the question say aye, against no, the ayes have it.